we have a great uh, little discussion coming up now. Uh, we're going to meet up with uh, some members of the International Ranger um, Federation. And uh, let's take a little look at uh, who we have uh, joining us live uh, right now. So we're going to spend a little time with uh, Monica Alvarez uh, Melvito. She's an International Ranger Federation uh, officer. We've got Chris uh, Galliers joining us. He's the International Ranger Federation uh, president. And then rounding out the group, uh, that we'll be talking to now uh, as we have uh, Rohit Singh joining us. Uh, and uh, Rohit, I had the pleasure of hosting him not too long ago during our Global Biodiversity Festival. And, uh, you know, it, you're hard pressed to find someone more passionate about rangers and, and advocating uh, for rangers uh, more than Rohit. So I'm going to bring everybody in for a quick hello and then we'll start uh, asking some questions. So, so great to see everybody joining us live today. Um, I see some familiar faces from this morning, uh, but it's great to see everybody. Hi. Hi, Joe. Hi, yeah, Joe. thanks very much. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's been... Tired now, for sure, but uh, you've done an incredible job. Really, you have. Well done. Um, I'm being uh, buoyed by all the stories and uh, all the excitement, all the passion, uh, and yeah, I mean, everybody's so excited to share their their stories today. So uh, I feel pretty lucky. No, uh, that's fantastic. Yeah. All right. Well, let's start asking a few questions here, and let's uh, let's let, let's dig a little deeper into the International Ranger uh, Federation. So I'm going to tuck a couple of us backstage for the moment and leave someone trapped here with me. So Chris, this first question is for you. Uh, what is the International uh, Ranger Federation, and what are its priorities? Yeah, th thanks, Joe. Um, the International Ranger Federation is made up of uh, ranger associations from around the world. Um, it was uh, referred to earlier in the day, um, you know, Gordon Miller and, and a few others from the UK um, got together and, and eventually initiated the International Ranger Federation, which was actually founded uh, on this day in uh, 1992. Hence, we have this day as World Ranger Day. Um, so the, the mission of the Federation is to develop, uh, advance and promote throughout the world community, the ranger profession and its critical role in the conservation of nature and cultural resources. So at the moment, we've got um, quite a diverse membership. Um, we've got over, over 100 and um, close to 150 um, members, uh, including ranger associations and other organizations. Um, we have seven regions um, across the world, and in each region we have a, a regional representative base there. And um, the, our, one of the main things that we do is involved in um, developing networks, ranger networks, and many of the people that have been on here um, are members or members of associations that are members of the International Ranger Federation. And uh, uh, Steve Peach actually said, you know, that there's such value of the network of rangers, where rangers uh, feel that they're part of uh, a bigger picture. They're part of the ranger family around the world. And, you know, we see that when we have the World Ranger Congresses coming together. Um, we, we've had uh, ranger congresses just about every four years, uh, three to four years since 1995. Um, and as we know, the last one was in, in Chitwan, um, Nepal. Where we had over 500 rangers, 550 rangers coming together from over 80 countries. So it was really, um, it's about networking, um, setting up uh, partnerships, uh, strengthening the range and um, ranges themselves uh, at a regional level through regional associations, and then working down to national and subnational ranger associations as well. Um, so there's, as I said, there's a lot of ranger, um, diverse ranger associations across the world that come together. And then obviously we also, you know, heavily involved in working with partners, um, the Thin Green Line Foundation and, uh, and URSA that's been developed to, again, deliver on what we have as a mandate, made up mainly of voluntary members um, from across the world as well. And uh, yeah, I think it's it's an exciting organization that has, unfortunately, like most of the, most organizations in conservation are, are undercapacitated 
but with a huge amount to do and hugely committed people as rangers are, um, who, who never shy away from the task at hand. Uh, we also obviously involved in, you know, today World Ranger Day, and uh, we do a lot around the tracking of the range of deaths, which we will get to talk to a little bit later. So, yeah, I think that sort of sums up um, the Ranger Network. And, you know, we, we act as a voice, try and act as a voice for Rangers. Many Rangers on the ground don't have the ability to, to engage or to have a voice um, at a global level. Um, so we carry that responsibility on behalf of the Rangers on the ground. All right, excellent. And you know, I, I think that networking is key. I think it's it's really important to know that there's other people around the world, uh, you know, in, engaged in the same, um, you know, fight, engaged in the same uh, activities. And I, I think that's kind of comforting a little, knowing that you're not alone. Yeah, no, it is. It's hugely important. Um, and uh, you know, we have strong, strong networks. As you, I mean, as you can see from today. Um, no matter where you come from, rangers have so much in common, uh, and that's what that's what makes um, it so so easy for rangers to to come together. Um, and it really is, I must say, something very special that bond between rangers who face similar challenges, no matter where you are in the world. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, I'm going to make a little swap out here. I'm going to bring Monica in with me for a moment. Hey, Monica. Hello. All right. So Monica, uh, can you uh, tell me a little bit about the Ranger Associations uh, and the current work that the IRF is doing in that regard? Yes, sure. Um, as Chris mentioned, it's very important for us to work with the Ranger Organization and Association. So at the moment, we're collaborating with the University of Central Florida with Professor William Moreto and the doctoral student Richard Ellickson. They're from the Department of Criminal Justice. And IRF is collaborating with them because for us it's very important and the study is to examine the role that these rangers um, associations play and the perception of rangers of these associations. The intention later is to understand the role and how they support rangers and how those associations can be supported by um, alliances and, and other stakeholders. So uh, the intention of this study is that the results will come out for the next World Ranger Congress that should be in 2023. And at the moment, we're just trying to help the University of Florida to get as much voices, and as much interviews with Rangers on the ground that we can. And the study covers questions such as, you know, what are the associations for? Why do you join an association? What's the role that the members have if they have a president a vice president a secretary how they sort of the governance of the of the association and also we've been you know um i don't want to go ahead with the results of the study because it's too soon to to do so but very interesting things are coming out as you know the reasons why they join is because they want to be in contact with other rangers they sort of want a representation of what they do they want to, um, some say that they want opportunities to attend, for example, to congresses such as the World Congress, uh, for Rain the Ranger World Congress. So it's very interesting things that are coming out and it's the first study ever done on this regard about the associations and how the governance works on those. Uh, also, we're asking them, well, the, the university is asking them what challenges they face to sort of get to, uh, you know, formalize the associations. Some take I don't know, six months, but some associations have been in the process for so like 10 years with the intention of, of building it. Some associations are, are very local, but most the ones that we're targeting are the national associations uh, to understand with a broader uh, sort of scope what, what's going on. Also what the benefits are, right? Um, and some of the benefits that come out might be just, as I said, to be heard by other colleagues, to have a representation uh, we've heard like stories of, for example, in Ecuador, it's well known that thanks to the association, some of the um, some of employees that lost their jobs in a big, in a huge sort of um, budget cut, they got rehired thanks of for the the job that the association did, or maybe another successful uh, story. Well, not a successful story, but something to point us as a benefit of an association and where it can lead to is. In Chile, they're trying to put a seat in the, you know, in the in the decision making for the 
representative or president of, of that uh, national association. So it's, it's very important for us to really understand what's going on to see how we can support that. And yeah, it's that, that's it for the moment, but wait for the results in a couple of years or hopefully less for pre preliminary results. And it's going to be very interesting and for us to know how to support it. All right. Very exciting. And, you know, it, it's always great to have somebody advocating for you. And I think that's something associations could definitely do uh, for those Rangers. All oh. right. Awesome. Thanks, Monica. Uh, OK, um, let's bring uh, Rohit in with us. Uh, so, Rohit, what what do you see, you know, as a Ranger yourself, what do you see uh, in the value of a, a Ranger association? Thanks, thanks, Joe. First of all, great. You're doing an amazing job. I don't know how you're doing it, but you're doing an amazing job. Um, I think I think Ranger associations, let me do it. It, it, it sort of helps at three levels. Uh, one is that it gives Rangers a sort of power to collectively bargain for their rights. Uh, otherwise, you are heavily dependent on charities or somebody else to do bargain for you. Ranger Association give that collective bargaining power. Second, it's sort of a, you know, when, when you are in college, who do you talk to about your problems? You talk to your college friends. And, and Ranger Association sort of became that body where you can share, it, it gives that family feeling where you can sort of share your challenges, where you can celebrate good things. And the final thing is that Ranger Associations are sort of the way how Rangers can connect each other with each other, not just at, uh, you know, at a provincial level or at national level, but also at a global level. And let me give you a couple of examples where Ranger associations have been really, really impactful. And, and these examples come from the country where I come from in India. So in, in India, we have general election every five years, and then we pretty much every year, we have two or three provincial elections. And these are huge exercises in a country like India, where you know every government officer has to be appointed for election duties. And uh, 10 years back, Ranger Association started sort of asking or started fighting for exemption of range of workforce from the election duties. Because when they are on election duty, which is a long process in India, there is nobody taking care of the forest. And now Rangers are exempted from election duties like uh, other armed forces. They do not have to uh, be taken out of the forest for election duties. Another thing which Ranger Association, which we were talking a couple of days back on another event, they bargained for Rangers being designated as a non-family posting, which means you are then eligible for the benefits which other, like Army gets, because they, it's a non-family posting, means your family gets starts getting some benefits and you get some hardship allowance. So I think Ranger Association have been really good with regard to the region where we work and, and I represent Ranger Federation of Asia and also the International Ranger Federation in Asia, it is an upcoming, it, it's sort of the, the, the concept is building up. In South Asia, we have a very good representation in Southeast Asia also, we are building Ranger associations. One of the challenge which we face is sometimes Ranger associations are seen as a political body, which they are not. They are completely a political body and that is something which rangers always have to keep in mind that we have to stay uh as a as a sort of as a uh, a political body otherwise we won't be able to ask for what we are asking for and i see a lot of momentum in the region uh and that's why we hosted the last world ranger congress in asia in 2019 and i'm proud to say it was the largest ever congress with the best uh, diversity of Rangers, right from indigenous rangers to female rangers. So I think we are making good progress. And I feel uh, ranger associations will, going forward, be the main vehicle for reforms in the ranger workforce. Well, strength in numbers. So it's great to hear that there's you know more associations, more uh, rangers are, are getting together. Um, and I really liked your, your college example of, you know, uh, talking with friends and, you know, like an open space where you can feel comfortable sharing and talking. And uh, I think that's really important. Good stuff. Thank you. 
Okay, I'm gonna bring Chris uh, back in here for this next question. So Chris, uh, can you uh, tell us what is the, the IRF role of honor? The role of honor, um, which the IRF has been um, maintaining is, is around uh, recording ranger deaths. Uh, I mean, we, we obviously, uh, every ranger death we feel is one too many, um, but at the same time, we want to recognize rangers that lose their lives uh, in the line of duty. And we do also record um, other um, ranger deaths because it's important. First of all, I think um, we've got to just uh, thank um, some of the people behind this who have been maintaining this record for, for many years, uh, Roger Cole and Jeff Olfs, who've done a fantastic job. Um, you know, they've even gone back into the historical records looking at ranger deaths. And uh, um, we've got, you know, the earliest one on our records is uh, in 1886. Uh, and that was uh, Lyman Hill and Charles Niles, who were game wardens um, in, in Maine. And they were killed by poachers. Uh, so we've got sort of a sporadic, um, you know, record based on reports and so on going all the way through, um, obviously getting better and better as networks uh, improved all the way through today. So we, we, we're getting um, much better information, which is, which is really good. And, and the value of this information um, is, uh, particularly in the, in the last 10 years where our records have been pretty good, is we can start looking at the sort of trends um, identifying where ranger deaths are happening, what is um, what is the cause, and then obviously looking at solutions and interventions to address um, these ranger deaths. So obviously this year we, we've put out the role of honor and there's 120 ranger deaths that have been recorded um, and they, they spread out across, um, you know, motor accidents, disease, drowning, homicide, animals, general accidents and um, unknown and then fire. Um, so what we see over the last 10 years, which is really interesting, is that, um, you know, if we, if we look at firefighting, for example, we've, we're seeing a, a, a quite an increase in the trend of rangers who are dying there. And, and let me use firefighting as an example where, you know, if, there, if there's an increased number of rangers dying, what is the underlying cause and what can we do to address that? Um, it might be we need to strengthen First of all, where is this happening most of the time? And can we strengthen the training, the firefighting training? Is it as a result of climate change that we're seeing more fires? And therefore, we really need to improve the equipment and uh, safety of rangers who go out there to fight fires. So it really does help guide us in the interventions. And the same we're seeing for things like motor vehicle accidents as well. There's an upward trend. Um, animal rela related deaths uh, increase in, in that. Now, it, it's not as if our biodiversity is increasing and the number of animals is generally increasing, um, but it's because there's an increased probably human population, less availability of, of you know, the space and the human wildlife conflict um, between humans and, and, ra and, uh, and the animals resulting in possibly um, increased uh, range of deaths from animals. We, we, we need to dig deeper into that. Interestingly, however, we're seeing a downward trend on homicides. Um, but at the same time, we've got to take that, uh, we've got to look at that very carefully because not all ranger deaths are reported. Um, and particularly some homicides might, are, are probably the ones that will go unreported the most um, because of various reasons. Um, so, so yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible tool. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's ranger deaths out there uh, it, it is a dangerous job. We recognize that. Every ranger knows that. Um, but at the same time, it gives us an opportunity to also celebrate and give recognition to those that have, have been before, you know, see, families and colleagues, seeing, seeing those that have passed their names there uh, forever um, etched into, into the, the role of honor, I think is a great tribute to rangers uh, across the world. And um, yeah, so I think we're trying to grow grow the, 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 the information um, and that's, you know, that is developing through social media networks, uh, through the strengthening of our own ranger networks, more ranger associations. I think we're getting more reliable data, which, which is uh, really giving us a good data set to, uh, as I said earlier, to guide us in developing and pushing for various interventions.
important statistics to collect and and you're right it's a, it's a dangerous job and 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 those who who you know made that ultimate sacrifice should be honored and remembered yeah yeah okay um so monica i'm going to bring you back in here for a moment uh monica could you tell us about the first state of the ranger report yes sure um, well, the first idea of a State of a Ranger report came in uh, 2016 in the World Ranger Congress in Colorado. That The first question was, what is a ranger? And I took some years to figure, not to figure out, but you know how uh, rangers are, have very diverse roles and they are named differently depending where they are. So we're getting, I mean, much closer with, with that question, but suddenly we have other questions sort of about the ranger profession. How can we measure if we're going in the right direction and how to measure that? All these questions uh, ended up in, well, in Nepal in the 2019 World um, Ranger Congress. The, case, the question to answer is, I mean, how to measure if we're going right in this right direction to protect uh, to, of the ranger profession. So the goal of the report is to, it's in a very early phase as well, it's just starting. But it's sort of also to raise the profile of the ranger profession that it's very important to do of, because of everything we've heard today. And, and also to conduct like the first global report on where we are with the ranger profession to something we can have sort of, um, uh, what's the word in English? Um, how can we measure progress with indicators every per, about three to four years that it's uh, when the World Congress, Ranger Congress uh, takes place? how to measure that in between, how to know if we're doing in the right direction or not. So this report is being led by IRF, but not only by IRF, it's supported by, for example, ORSA members that we met the, this morning. And also, for example, ORSA has a working group on data and metrics, and that's going to be a super important to help with the conduction of this uh, State of the Ranger report. It's important also to keep it balanced, to keep it practical and not... Um, be too ambitious knowing that it's the first one, but ambitious enough that we can really resolve some of these questions because there's so many questions that are not being resolved as Chris mentioned before. Others, for example, are how many rangers are there worldwide? We still don't have that number. Um, there's a good, uh, there's a study going on and, and, and we're close to have an average on those numbers, but we don't have that number yet. And also what types of rangers there are because it's not only you know, government rangers, there are private rangers, there's indigenous rangers, there are different types of people that hire rangers or that are hired by, by different institutions. And also an important question to have in mind is with the new, maybe if you have heard of the new initiative of 30 by 30, um, in the next, I mean, for the 20, in the, in the next decade, we need to conserve 30% of the territory. That's sort of the, the goal. But how are we going to do that with, um, because the reality is every time there's more area to protect, but with more different con um, difficulties and challenges and maybe difficult access to resources for rangers. So how are we going to address that? Um, we know it's not only protected areas are going to cover this initiative, but we still, we, st we have to think those um, questions and, and, you know, be part of those negotiations, put rangers in the middle of those negotia uh, negotiations because there's, they're the ones on the field doing the job. So yeah, answer questions like, what is the change needed for the ranger profession? Those sort of questions we really need to try to address as well, uh, also the ones that uh, Chris mentioned before and some others regarding standards. What standards, is there working standards for rangers and also ORSA in the in the morning gave, an, well, in the morning for us, gave uh, some good examples of that on that regard in the Chris Gordon's presentation. So really the state of the ranger report, just to say in brief is, to find uh, some answers to where the ranger profession is and where should it be and how can we make it better. Thank you. Great, Monica, thank you for that description. Uh, and, uh, you know, again, it's, it, I think rangers definitely deserve a seat at the table. I mean, if you're asking somebody to, to go out and risk their life and, and to protect these areas that are so important, then absolutely. Uh, there should be a say uh, in in what happens going forward. Thank you, Monica. Okay, so uh, one more question uh, for this session today, uh, addressing the the Global Ranger Code of Contact uh, Conduct. So I'm going to bring Chris and Rohit in for this one, and maybe we'll let Chris uh, come in first. 
And then Rohit, if you want, you can follow up afterwards. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, the Rainbow Code of Conduct was uh, is a very important document um, that we've we got out uh, this year. Um, it was, you know, with great assistance uh, through the URSA partnership as well. Uh, we ran a, a very, you know, Chris Gordon um, sort of touched on it in his presentation uh, as sort of one of the themes and one of the outcomes uh, or output so far from the, the URSA partnership. But we led a process that was really interactive with rangers across the world um, where we look to um, develop a code of conduct. And the reason for that was to build and, uh, and strengthen um, the reputation and understanding of the sector um, so that, you know, at a global level, people can get a better sense of what ranges are about and what they strive to do. What are the values of a ranger? Because we identified the, the, those values. And then also it provides an operational framework for rangers and supporters of the profession. Uh, it also helps guide rangers themselves uh, as by having a code of conduct and looking at ranger employees and as well and um, possible supporters and how how it can be used to assist in in better in making better decisions. And and lastly, it looks to uh, promote the implementation of a globally accepted best practice and can contribute to the prevention of rangers uh, violating laws and regulations. And we've seen that you know in, in, in more recent times the issues around human rights, uh, potential human rights, rights abuses by rangers and, and so on. And, and here we've got a code that rangers can subscribe to. And it's important to understand that what we did was obviously it's difficult to develop a code for, for all rangers around the world. I mean, the rangers operate uh, under you know, completely different circumstances and context. Um, and as Monica said, you know, the definition which we do have in the code is defining a range and we came up with all the various terms that we could find of what you know ranges are, are called um, so we've defined that that work of a ranger and it's up to those rangers around the world in the particularly through ranger associations um, and organizations uh, as partners under ursa can use this code of conduct and change it to suit and meet their, their context uh, for example you know the, the the conduct talks about you know how to um, work uh, and be responsible in terms of the use of firearms well that's not applicable necessarily to quite a few ranges in, in various parts of the world so so that can be that can be taken out so it, it's it's a it's one that's going to that's adaptive um, it's also one that as the irf we will continue to review so we leave the door open on this for people to contribute their, their feedback to us continually to ensure that we maintain a code of conduct that is relevant to the global context at any given time as well. And lastly, it's also very important, you know, one of the challenges with, with rangers and working in, in any sort of global organization is the issue of language. So, um, you know, we're really grateful to many people in the, in the ranger network who have assisted in getting the code of conduct translated into many different languages to make it as usable in just about every corner of the planet that we can to assist rangers on the ground. I can tell I'm getting tired now because I'm starting to forget the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you, Chris. I'm going to bring uh, Rohit in now to see if uh, he'd like to add to that. Hi, Joe. Um, I, I think I think Chris has covered pretty much everything. Uh, I, I would summarize this uh, in in sort of one line. Uh, we do we need more boots. We need better boots, but at the same time, we need responsible boots on the ground, and that's what code of conduct does. It creates that responsibility uh, factor for rangers. Uh, and at the end, I will just Monica was talking about number of rangers. I'll leave you with an important and a shocking figure. Uh, we are almost there with the census of how many rangers are there globally in the protected areas. I can't tell you the number, but I can tell you there are more hairdressers in the UK than rangers in the world, world's protected areas. That's an unbelievable statistic uh, right there, uh, Rohit. And, you know, I really like, again, the way you phrase that, um, the code of conduct. And I think, I think a, uh, an accepted code of conduct uh, across rangers the you know the spectrum of rangers would really bring you know uh, more legitimacy to 
um, to the field, which I don't think it needs anymore. But um, uh, you know, clearly it does because the recognition's not there, um, and you know, Rangers should be celebrated more. So, uh, a recognized code of conduct, I think, could be a big step in that direction. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's bring everybody back in here, Chris, Monica. All right. Well, thanks uh, for this session. It was really great to dive a little bit deeper into the IRF. Um, what I've gathered so far is there's a lot going on uh, and that's important and that's exciting. And it sounds to me like over the next few years, we're going to hear a lot of more information coming out, a lot more data coming out. And I think that's really going to help make a lot more informed decisions. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the key thing there is that there's such a, a sort of a shortage of, of, of information around ranges. And, uh, you know, thanks to work, a lot of the work that uh, Rohit's involved in as well, um, we really are starting to um, get some really good information that can guide us and, as you say, give us uh, an opportunity to have more informed decisions on how we and what solutions we come up with as well. All right. Well, uh, again, a, a huge thanks uh, to our panel today, uh, Rohit, uh, Chris, uh, and Monica. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank you for your contributions. Um, and yeah, I, I, it's great to see you, uh, Rohit. I'll see you in about uh, half an hour. I think we've got another hangout uh, yeah. together, so I'm looking forward to that. Uh, and for Chris and Monica, have a have a great rest of the weekend. Thank you, Joe. And, and again, from the IRF, big thank you for the work today. You've done an incredible job. Thank you. Thank All you right. for the invitation. Thank you so much.